Okay, hi, wow. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, there's my website. I just redid the website after seven years. It looks the same, but there's some new pictures and it looks cleaner and all that, so you might want to check that out. Thank you for coming on this miserable spring, supposedly spring day. I, uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I like to take questions as we go. I'll make sure I repeat them for the video. So if you have questions, uh, just ask them or raise your hands. I can barely see you. And I'm sorry you have to see me at an angle. This is kind of strange uh, configuration. So this is billed as um, doing long term, how to turn long term projects into books. I kind of specialize in doing long, let's talk about long term projects first and then and we'll get into books very shortly. I seems that I just, you know, almost by accident got into doing long term projects. It just suits me. I'm patient, I'm thorough, I'm a little slow, I'm plotting, whatever. And uh, so my long term projects consist of six years. Did a book on twins, identical twins, six years. A book on artists, six years. A book on uh, Coney Island, 27 years. That was my third book in 1997. A book on Italy, it Italian photographs, 10 years. I did a book two years ago, Coney Island, 40 years. Uh, you may have seen the book, 40 years. So I'm doing another book on Coney Island. Guess what? Coney Island, what? 50 years. I have six more years to go. I think I'll last. Uh, this is the newest book that came out last October, uh, Harlem, 23 years. So I love working long term. And by the way, I brought a few books. If you want to look at them, if you want to purchase one, I'll be happy to sign it. Um, so I, I just like going back to the same places all the time. Uh, I still go to Coney Island. I, I was there uh, sa uh, Saturday, as a matter of fact. I still go to Harlem and photograph. So it, it's like a comfort zone. It's like a third or fourth home. I get to know the place, the people, and it just evolves. I'm not in a rush. So what I suggest to all my students, and by the way, I do teach at ICP. I teach a lot of classes there and workshops. Um, find something to shoot that engages you over the year. Well, you don't know if it's going to be over the years, but uh, that you're interested in, that you think you can sink, sink, sink your teeth into. And um, keep doing it. Do it for a couple months. Do it for six months. Do it for a year. And see where it's going. Um, my objective with these projects is to turn them into books. I think the best thing I could do in photography, or the the most gratifying in a way, um, not besides the shooting and meeting the people, is to turn these images into book form. Books last. Uh, they're good for your career. I'll talk about reasons for doing books. But the, 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 the peak of, of my, um, I don't know, uh, endeavors is to turn work into books. Okay, and. Uh, Shows are nice. I've had many, many shows. Magazine articles are really nice, but they last for a month or so. A book lasts for years and is, in a sense, a legacy. So, um, and I work on many projects at once. I have right now six book projects in the works. I'm meeting with my publisher uh, in May for my seventh book, and that's finished. I have about six books that are really finished, but I'm going to continue to work on them. I want to do one book every two or three years. I don't want to bring out a lot of books at one time because then each book would not sell enough, probably. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I like working on project, multiple projects at the same time. If you get stuck on a, a project, you get bored, you, you want to leave it, you, you have something else to go shoot. And then you come back to your uh, original project or that project that you left behind and you're fresh after three months or six months and when I'm out shooting I might be shooting for one thing or one project and lo and behold hey there's a set of twins that I'm still working on that and I get that a photograph 
uh, that day for that other project. So they kind of mix and match and come and go. Um, and uh, it seems to work out. So I think the key is to be patient. Everyone's in a rush. Uh, we're all like busy and we all want to be famous tomorrow, if not yesterday. Um, take your time, work with patience, print images. I'm, I make prints, whether it's digital, I still work in the dark room. I'm going in there Friday. Um, I like to make, I make eight by 10 prints and I start sequencing the work almost immediately, uh, compiling it, understanding what I have, and um, uh, it, it just seems to take time and it just flows and you know, the years go by. Uh, so don't be in a rush and make sure it's as good as you can do it. You know, don't compromise. And that's why I like to work long term also because I can change it, I can alter it, I can, uh, I'm learning as I'm shooting, I'm learning uh, what I'm doing, what it's really about, I'm learning more about the subject, about the, uh, the place or the kind of person that I'm photographing, and I become the expert, and I think that's really important. You want to be the expert on this, uh, or a, an expert, not the expert, but an expert on the subject that you're shooting. I, I learned so much about the nature of being a twin. I did a book on artists. I think I didn't mention that one. Uh, that was six years. I learned about, and I interviewed 165 artists for the book and photographed them in their studios, famous artists. I learned about the art world. I learned about creating. Um, and I met, you know, you make friends along the way too, which is, doesn't, doesn't hurt. So, um, Think about what you're doing in photography. I always ask my students, why are you doing what you're doing? What, is it, what are your motivations? You know, we don't have that long to be here. Uh, the time goes quickly. I want to spend my time in the most fruitful way possible, and that's photographing what I like to photograph and what I want to photograph. I'm not worried about making money. I don't make money with books. Not many people do. Uh, I want to be happy with what my life and what I'm doing. I want to satisfy my own uh, needs and, and um, I don't want to sound like I'm selfish, but I, I want to satisfy, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, what I, uh, I want to do and um, it makes me a better person. I guess it makes me happier and then I can be nicer to everyone else. If I'm happy, then I hope I make other people happy. And then I'm able to um, teach and uh, um, transmit or uh, share the things that I've learned. Okay, So think about a project and maybe it's not so long term, but it will become long term if you really are engaged in it. So I'm sure many of you, do, most of you do projects, uh, you've worked on projects. Uh, has anyone done a book at all? Oh great. Books are, so I, I've been working 40, since 1970, so what, 40, 44 years almost, um, about, I've done six books, okay. So books are really hard to do. They take a lot of time. Um, six books in 44 years. So I've had many, many, sh way more shows than that. I've had been in magazines way more times. So it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal and I don't treat it lightly. Uh, I know photographers that have 15 books, 20 books. Henry Hornstein probably has over 30 books. I know most photographers don't have any books, or maybe they have one book. It's, it's hard. So again, I think it's a great accomplishment to a, do a book, and I think that's a, a terrific uh, aspiration. It's a terrific thing to aim for and, and maybe accomplish. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about what a book is, what a book is and what it means and um, uh, kind of how we should maybe think about it. It's, it's, it's obviously images. It should have a beginning, middle, and end. It should have a theme. It should be singly focused, you know. The thing that ruins most books and why they get rejected is that you don't, the, the photographer does not have a coherent 
focused vision or theme. So the theme is really important. And I think the theme should be narrow. The narrower the theme, maybe the better. So if you say, I'm doing New York, well, that's a heck of a theme. I mean, that, and by the way, New York books sell. But what about New York? Is it New York at night? Is it New York? Uh, below 14th Street? Is it Central Park, New York? Is it uh, Harlem, New York? Is it Brooklyn, New York? Is it Coney Island, New York? Is it Midtown? Is it one block? Uh, there was a book years ago called 14th Street where two photographers, Cy Rubin and Larry Siegel, did photograph for several years 14th Street river to river. And, it was a tr and this was in the 70s when East 14th Street was really funky and dangerous, and West 14th Street area was kind of nice. So there was a big contrast. So you can take your block, you can take your neighborhood, or a neighborhood, and, and, and photograph it. Um, Bruce Davidson did East 100th Street. I think that was about three blocks that he photographed and did a classic uh, book that got exhibited and all kinds of raves and whatever. So um, pick a, that theme again, and I think the narrower the better. If it's all over the place, then you have, it's too confusing. So try to narrow it down. Okay, so I think a, 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 photo, a photo book is uh, something beyond just a collection of individual images. What you do not want to do is your 50 best photographs or your 100 be hits, your best hits. Uh, if we are famous, maybe we can get away with that. Maybe an Ansel Adams or, uh, I mean, I don't even know, that, but, uh, you know, and, uh, Avedon. But even Avedon, he did in the American West. So it, uh, less and less do I see a book based on someone's best hundred photographs. Again, we, they, the publishers want a theme, okay? So it's a collection, beyond, it's photographs beyond the collection of images. It, it should have a life of its own. I think of it as an object in of itself. And what, I buy books, I love books. And to do a book, you probably have to love books. And the books become part of our family. I mean, I, I like looking at them, but I like them on the shelves also. And I like when people come over and I like sharing them. A book costs less than a tie would cost. I don't wear ties any longer, thank goodness. And um, so, you know, when you think about, oh, should I buy this book or not? Well, it's not a lot of money, and it's something you have for the rest of your life, hopefully, and it's something you can refer to and learn from and, and be entertained by and enjoy. So I don't have to preach that to you. So it is an object in of itself. Um, we could talk about the design of the book. I think the design should not overwhelm the photograph. So we want to design the book, but the photograph should speak. And I use text, but again, I don't want the text to overwhelm the photographs. It's a, photo, it's a photographic book that happens to have some text, okay? So um, it's not the other way around, mostly text with some photographs. And I see a lot of photo books with more text than it, sh it should have. Um, the best book should be an expression of your vision, of your uh, intelligence, of your ideas, of what you want to convey and uh, discuss. Um, you know, it can be black and white, it could be color, it could be digital, it could be uh, a mixture of stuff. Uh, um, but the style and the theme should be consistent. Um, make a book that's personal that you can stand behind. Your butt is on the line when you make a book. Your reputation is on the line. So um, if you are not happy with it, if you think it's a little wishy-washy, it's not strong enough, don't do it yet. Make it stronger. Uh, you're going to be responsible for it. It's not the publisher that's going to be responsible for it. And you want to do the best you can. So again, take your time. and. It, like, I signed a book contract for Coney Island. Um, the first book I did, it was 26 years, and I wanted another nine months to photograph. You'd think 26 years was enough. I still thought I didn't have 
this or that or that, and it was good that I did it because I added some really strong photographs. Okay. Um, a, the reason to do a book is not for money. Uh, you don't make a lot of money. We can discuss that. Really, the reasons, for, uh, to my way of thinking, for doing a book at, is that you have something to say, that you want to add something to the dialogue of this world, that you want to contribute, and that you have a vision or a special knowledge that you want to share. Okay? So probably that's the reason to do the book. Um, and it could be something that someone else has photographed, the, the, the subject, but you're going to do it differently. Uh, you should be aware of the competition and what other what is out there or has been published in the in, in, in the same category or theme as yours. Maybe there's none, and that's great. And maybe there's one or two, but I would not be um, um, disheartened by that. I did my uh, artist book. It took six years, and the, in that time, there were three or four other photographers, including Robert Maplethorpe, that did a book on artists. Uh, he did it on California artists. Arnold Newman was alive then, and he did a book while I was working on my artist book. And every time I said, oh my goodness, that doesn't help me much, but maybe it adds to the category. And when I was ready, I went out and found a publisher, and then uh, and it got published. So those other books didn't really affect my book. Um, okay, I would say try to do a book to change people's minds. Uh, you know, I don't want to get too highfalutin and all that, but um, do a book on its subjects that matter, that certainly matter to you. It could be you. It could be your self-portraits. Uh, uh, Eleanor Carucci just pho photographs herself and her family, but they're really beautiful and insightful. So, um, okay. And again, the book should have a single point of view, your point of view, and uh, make it as focused as possible. Okay. Um, I'll address how to find a publisher now. It's a good question, and I'm going to come to it anyway. You look at other books. You, you go to ICP's bookstore. You go to Barnes & Noble. I mean, there aren't many. Go to uh, Photo Eye. It's a, 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 a bookstore in Santa Fe, but online. They have a great presence, photoeye.com. And they have... Uh, You'd have to look at one of their links. They have a listing of publishers and what books they publish. Photo Eye only publishes, only sells photography books, and they have a gallery. Is anyone aware of Photo Eye? They're in Santa Fe. And so you have to do research. To do a book, you need to research the category. Go to uh, bookstores, go online, um, and Look at books in person. That's getting harder and harder, it seems. And to see what publishers are publishing the books that you like and maybe that your book looks like or it covers the topics that, they, uh, th that, 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 that you are dealing with. Okay? Um, so pick up books. You don't have to buy them necessarily, but you want to look at them. ICP has a really good library. You can go in there. Uh, it's downstairs on West uh, 43rd Street and 6th Avenue. You can go to the ICP library. I think they have 30,000, 40,000 photo books in the library. And you, you can't take them out, but you can sit there all day and, or go through the stacks. It's not a real big room. Uh, and, and, and pull out books and look at them and see what publisher is consistently doing books that you like and that you think your book looks like. I mean, that's the best way. Another way would be, do you have photographer friends who have done books? And then maybe talk to them, and what's their experience with this publisher or that publisher? Um, the books, by the way, have the publisher's um, address and probably phone number in the book. And another key that I think is really important is go to the acknowledgement page of the book. Okay? The photographer writes an acknowledgement thanking his or her spouse, his Aunt Sophie, his Uncle Mo, <laughs> you know, uh, the book designer, the editor, 
uh, and you know half the world. And if he's mentioning the editor of his book, that's the person that worked on this book that you like. And that person works at uh, Random House. And here's J Joe Jones, my editor. Thank you. You did a great job. Without your help, this book couldn't have happened. And there's a name. OK, so what I suggest is you don't send emails. Get the phone number of Random House on 50th Street. Call and ask for Joe Jones and get them on the phone. And, I, and another hint would be call after 5 o'clock because he thinks it's his wife calling him <laughs> about supper. <laughs> and he's, he'll answer the phone directly. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll leave it go. Or maybe if he has an assistant, which I doubt these days, uh, the assistant will answer. So do it on a little off time and keep calling and have a little spiel ready to go, like two minutes. Oh, my name is Harvey Stein, and I love your books, and I have a book project. It's on uh, you know, West 57th Street, and it's just right for your, your I, I know your books, and it's, it just would fit into your book line perfectly. Can I make an appointment to see you? Bang, 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 a minute and a half. And he'll say, no, no, I'm not, you know, or drop it off. All right, so at least he knows your name, right? Or he might say, OK, or call me back in a month. You want to be persistent. I know for a fact they don't really answer emails from strangers. And they probably won't answer. Uh, if you send them a CD, they probably won't look at it. No one really looks at CDs that much anymore. You want to get a face-to-face. -face. And it's hard. It's hard. If you know someone, get an introduction, that's great. I met m one of my editors for my second book, uh, the artist book, uh, Robert Morton. He was an editor. He was teaching a class on how to get photo books done uh, and published at ICP. I took his class. It was, I think, a five-week class. So by the end of five weeks, I knew him. He knew me. I showed him some work during the class. And I said to him, I remember vividly, can I come by? you know, make a point, make an appointment with you to show you some work. And how could he say no? You know, I was in his class for five weeks, for three, you know, 15 hours. So how could he say no? Um, I do a class, by the way, here's another plug, uh, <laughs> called uh, Publishing your, your Photo Book. I do it in December at ICP. It's a two-weekend two weekend class. And I have people from the industry uh, do uh, a guest lecture. So I have publishers. I have a photographer usually who's done a book and he shares his insights and how he did the book, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another way. Uh, go to uh, events. Go to, go to like, um, if, if you know there's a panel on book publishing, photo book publishing, like at uh, Photo Expo, for instance, go to that and then hang out and try to talk to the person after and get them your card or uh, get their card and, and then subsequently call them. What you have to be is ready. You can't, and let me address that. I, I'm never finished, well, usually, usually I'm not finished with a book. I'm, a ha I'm halfway through it. And I have 50 images that I can show. With a book proposal, and I'm gonna get to that, uh, and, and, and um, if, I ha if I'm not ready and I just have an idea, they're not going to be interested. You want to show them images. And the best way to do that is a face-to-face -face meeting, and you have 8 by 10s or you know, 8 and a half by 11s, uh, digital prints. They really want to see prints. Why? Because that's what they're dealing with. That's what a book is. It's not virtual. It's not online. Some people will look at, oh, send me a link to your email, or you know, your email, your your uh, website, and that might work, and they'll look at it. But uh, you might uh, send them f 10 JPEGs, and that might get them interested. But really, probably not. The best way is to have a meeting with them and have a stack of prints in the sequence that you see the book in, uh, and and it's already edited, and you have a meeting with them. The worst thing to do is you have 300 prints 
and say, here, make a book. That doesn't work. That is not going to fly. You want to be an active author. You want to sequence the work. You want to have good prints. You don't have to have you know, gallery-ready prints. Um, they shouldn't be large, and they shouldn't be small. They should be around 8 by 10, because that's kind of the size of the book, uh, you know, give or take a couple inches here or there. Did you say 50 kind of around the magic number? Uh, the question, 50, 50 uh, photographs, at least to show them. Yeah. Maybe the book is only 50 photographs. My first book, the twins book, had 55 photographs. I showed them probably 40. I want to know that I'm two-thirds of the way finished before I start showing the book. I don't have to be completely finished. And two-thirds, 70%, 75%, makes me think, ah, I have something. I feel confident I can finish it. I'm well on my way, and uh, I like it, and I think someone else will like it. I could wait till I'm finished 100% whenever that is. I'm never finished till the end until I give them the stuff. And, but that you don't have to wait that long. You can get the ball rolling a little sooner than that. And I, I recommend that. So uh, going in would say 20. Going in, how many? I would say 40 or 50. If you're showing a portfolio to a reviewer, like I was just at PhotoFest Reviewer, if you're reviewing images, they say, show 20 photographs. That's fine, showing a portfolio. But for a book, um, you know, I would say if there's 100 photographs in the book or 80, show about half. Think about at least half. And then if you have text, you want to have examples of the text. Is there text in the book? Most photo books have either none or a little. I like text for books because books I'm used to, reading books that have words in them. But again, I don't want a lot of words. So do you have a writer to write an introduction? Um, uh, is it poetry? Uh, is it your writing? Do you find a writer? Do you want a well-known writer? Like, I wanted Woody Allen to write for my Coney Island book. Of course, that was fantasy. Of course, that never happened, and I, where could I ever find him? And maybe that was for the best. But, um, you know, uh, I, have, I have introductory essays. I mean, two, two three pages. In the new book, I have two people that wrote for the book. One is a Harlem resident and writer. He's in the Black uh, Writers Hall of Fame, a fabulous writer. And I found him through a friend who's a photographer, Jules Allen. Uh, so you want to have a little text. So do you have text? If you do, great. You, you might show that to the, uh, for, for, to the editor. So what you want to do when you see an editor is have a package. And here's... Here's the stuff that you want in the package. You want 40, half the photographs. You want your resume, your bio. You want any text that is e uh, either already written, like I did interviews of the artists. So I had some good, in I picked 10 interviews out of the 40 that I, I, I already did, the best ones. I had one with, uh, you know, uh, Rauschenberg and whatever, and they, so uh, samples of the text, any PR, uh, not PR, but any um, um, gallery shows that you've had and you've had um, critiques of the shows or reviews, not bad reviews, <laughs> any, and having shows or any articles on you and about you and about the work that was published already, that's good because it shows the publisher that y other people are interested in it. So you put a package together, maybe the bio of the writer if he or she is not well known. So think of a package, and you're going to leave it with them. You're going to leave it, and it might be a month if you see them. If they say just bring it in, then um, that's fine too, but you want to get it back. And it, I'd, I'd say leave it for a month, and that's about it. Yes, another question. Supplying an on-demand print book. Okay, another thing that you can include. So the question is, what about supplying an on-demand print book? Um, another thing that you can include is what I call, and maybe this is a little old-fashioned, a book dummy. You've heard that term. A book dummy is a mock-up of the book. And in the old days, before we had Blurb and my publishers, you, you would maybe make a 
a mock-up with some prints and it's handmade and I did this and it could look pretty good and it's like uh, 16 pages, 16 prints, images, uh, zero, uh, color Canon laser Xeroxes, I've made some of these and that gives them a taste. So 50% of the uh, editors that I know like that and 50% of the editors don't like it. Why do they like it? It gives you an idea of what the book looks like. Why they don't like it? It's so specific that if they don't like what you've given them, they're going to reject it right away. Even though you say, no, this is an example. I'm open to other things. You've made it so specific, you know, and they just don't relate to it, then it's in their mind like that. So that's a danger. Plus, they enjoy working with the artists, with us, many of them, and helping to frame it and sequence it and lay it out and all that stuff. And that we're t and that I hear them say a lot, this is the f most interesting and most fun part of my job, and we've taken that away from them because you've done it already. Not to say that you shouldn't, so what I like to do is have a, the photographs loose in an 8x10 archival box or an 1114 archival box, you know, those, you can get them here. Just, you can have an idea of how you want the book to look and talk it better. And then they can go through it and really help. So, yes, yeah, so in this day and age, you can go to Blurb and make a Blurb book. There's a lot, there's a lot of companies, I use my publisher, I use Blurb in the past. I, there's Lulu, I think. There's iPhoto does it. I mean, there's, I'm not, uh, I don't use them that much, but yeah. And you have a nice book for $40 maybe, or $50, or, or tw you can do $20. What this does is it forces you to choose a cover, so that, that's good, and it forces you to choose a title. I mean, you could have a blank front page, but that doesn't look very sexy, and that's not going to sell your book. So, um, title, titles are really important, and that's another little subject. But try to get a title as soon as you can, as soon as you can. It could be a working title, it, it, and it, a title should communicate and uh, um, say what the you know the book is about and all that. I find titles are hard to do. I mean, my titles are pretty straightforward. Coney Island was one book. Coney Island, 40 Years, another book. Uh, Artists Observed. I mean, they're not very fancy. So uh, I want them to be descriptive and not ambiguous and kind of say what the, what the book is about. I want to talk about um, what the publisher looks for. And then if, if we know what the publisher looks for, then we can present that package, okay? Firstly, the photographs. They want photographs to look at. I mean, that's what it's about. And here are some terms. I'm going to read these words off that they say they're looking for. I, by the way, I don't believe it all, but uh, some are good. The work should be valid, compelling, okay? Moving, um, powerful, in-depth. So in-depth means not 10 pictures on the theme, but maybe 50 or 100. Um, universal, that's a good word, universal. Why do they like universal? Because that means a larger audience. It'll appeal to a greater number of people. That's, that makes sense, right? They want to sell books. So if the subject is really esoteric and really, really narrow, They'll, they might love it, but they'll probably say no, okay? Uh, so that's why, like, what sells? Celebrity, sex, not overt sex, but sexual or beautiful people and, you know, doing raunchy things, maybe. <laughs> uh, New York books sell. New York's good, because uh, New York's the center of the world and all that stuff. Um, what else? Probably... Maybe children, cute, cute dogs, animals, <coughs> that, that sells. So, um, you know, you can play to the market, which is fine, or you could not. 
But if it's real, real narrow, that could be a problem. So universal is a really good, good word. Interesting, uh, original, that's good. No one else has done it. So think about this. Important, I don't believe important. If it's too imp if it's p important, if it's political, it might be a problem. But, you know, if issue-oriented books, let me make this uh, statement. Issue-oriented books probably don't sell very well. In the 70s, 80s, yes. There was a book in the 70s called Gramps, or Gramp, Gramp. Uh, about the last year in, a, in the life of a man who was dying, he was in his 70s, at home, he chose to not go to hospital, and his grandsons were both photographers, Mark and Dan Jury, and they photographed him in the last year of his life and on his deathbed at home. That would never be published today. It sold, it sold, it sold really well. M multiple printings. Issue-oriented books on tough subjects, uh, we don't want to see that. Yeah, we have books on war now, right, I guess, but it's over there, it's way over there. We do have books, and that's, that's great. There are some publishers that might do that a little bit, but those are really hard. To, uh, overtly political books are hard to sell, okay? So the first thing that they're looking for is the work and the quality of the work. It should be high quality. But if it's really high but difficult subject matter, they may not do it, okay? Um, what's the competition? Are there any books out there that are like the book you're proposing? How do you find, if there is competition, uh, the same subject uh, has just been published in a book? Go to bookstores, look around. Um, there's a publication called Books in Print. You could get it at a library. You wouldn't get it at a bookstore. It's a double volume, I think. R.R. Uh, R. Balker, B-O-W-K-E-R is the publisher. You know, Barnes & Noble will have it. Like if you go to a bookstore and say, do you have, is, this, is there a book on twins in print? They could look it up for you and all that kind of stuff. So um, what's the competition? Oh, what has it been lately? Like has there been a book even two years ago that's been put out? that was published, a photo book, on, on your theme, okay? So um, be aware of that. And as you're working over the two or three or five years, you'll be aware of if something came out on your subject. A third thing, and this is really important, who is the audience for the book? Who's gonna buy the book? Who do you think will buy the book, okay? The larger the audience, the better. Okay, certainly. And are they reachable? Are they reachable? Can we advertise or send a message, if not ads? Can we reach them online? So is there a publication? Like you're photographing antique cars. Well, there's probably millions of antique car fairs, and there's probably a magazine or three on antique cars. I had a former student who did was trying to do a book on antique plane, airplanes, uh, vintage planes and, at air shows. And he photographed all of that. And there are all kinds of vintage air shows and there are publications. So that was a nice audience. Railroading, I mean, people love railroads. That's another category that sells. Military, that tends to sell. So are there organizations, like for twins, there, were, there are mothers of twin organizations all over the country. So my co-author, uh, the writer, I was the photographer, the writer, Ted Wolner and I, went to some of their meetings and talked about twinship and what we learned and all that kind of stuff. So what is the audience? Who are they? How big are they? And can we get to them if we do your book? Okay, that's really important. And let me put it another way. Is there a constituency greater than the photography world? So most publishers will say, we can sell 1,000 or 2,000 copies of any book, any photo book. To who? To photographers, to gallerists, to galleries, to book collectors, to people in the art world. Can we get beyond that number to have a more successful book. They don't want, they want, a, they want 
to sell 10, a, a good seller is 10,000 books. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Because you think, oh, a million copy book is the best seller. But we're not in that category. If you sell 5,000, 8,000 books, you're doing really well. So if you can sell like a blockbuster in photography, it might be 12,000 to 20,000 copies. It's not a lot, but, and photographers, they, we don't spend money too much on books, do we? We spend it on our cameras and, <laughs> and all that. And we're, we're pretty cheap because we have to. We, we're living, we're not rich, you know. But I always think I have to have that book. I have to have that book. So um, the audience is really important. And then they, they will, it, let's say you go in, they're interested, they're really interested. They'll do an analysis of the cost of doing the book what I call an economic, well, an economic rationale. And they're going to say, if we sell the book at $40, we'll be able to sell 3,000 copies. If we sell the book at uh, $25, maybe we'll do 5,000 copies. Obviously, the higher the price, the less the sales. Um, or they'll say, you know, this book's going to come in at 60 bucks the way you envision it with 180 photographs and four, uh, four color uh, black and white tritone, quad quadratone, uh, it's going to come at $60. We're not going to be able to sell the book. So you want to know how they're analyzing uh, the economics of the book, if, you, if they'll share that with you. Because you might say, OK, I won't, I, I'll cut the number of photographs down from 180 to 140, and we'll and we can sell the book at $49.95 instead of $59.95. And that might help. So they're going to do an analysis of what the costs are, what their costs are, and then what the selling price would be and how many books they, can, they think they can sell at that price. So if you share that with them or they'll share it with you, that would be helpful. The other thing that they'll look to is, can you bring something to the table? That doesn't mean money out of your pocket, although more and more there are book companies, publishers, that want you to pay some money, if not the whole freight, uh, a lot of it. And you know, I haven't been faced with that, so I'm not going to name names, especially if this is on YouTube. I don't want to get in trouble. But uh, I think we all know, I, I know at least three I could rattle off right now. I've never done that, pay for it. But, so, but here's, and I've never done these things too, but here's what you could do. You could say, I have a corporation who wants to buy 200 copies or 500 copies and give it to their best customers, you know, uh, because they like the book or they like me or I'm tied in with them or my uncle works there or whatever. That would be amazing. That might get them off the the middle of the fence and say, okay, we're not sure, but if you can guarantee us a thousand copy sales, we'll do the book. Um, they, if they hate the book or they don't like it or it doesn't fit into their program, no, no amount of money or promises or book sales will probably budge them and that would be real vanity and I, I don't think that's, that's good. Um, like if you're doing a book in Costa Rica, who flies to Costa Rica? I mean, you want to, you know, maybe uh, American Airlines, and ma maybe that's the major air, air, airline. So maybe you approach them and say, I'm doing this beautiful book on Costa Rica. I'd like you to send me down there many times so I don't have to pay. And would you like to buy at cost or, or, or at a little profit? You'll get a big discount, 40% off. Would you like to buy 500 copies? And then I can go to the publisher and say, look, I've already pre-sold 500 copies. And American would give it to their 500 best, highest point travelers, whatever, you know, frequent flyers. So you know, if you can get some corporate backing, or you, you win a grant, uh, and you have money to give because you won a grant, or, you know, or um, you know, stuff like that. that they, they respond to that. So m I've never had that, 
Uh, that's a little bit of a long shot, but you never know. You never know. Okay. So, kind of the things that they look for again are the photographs, what you can bring to the table, uh, what the competition is, the economic rationale, and probably you, who you are. If you're a first time pub pub published author, that's going to make it a little more difficult. If you have a long resume with five books, uh, in your hip pocket, that'll help a little. But what I have found is it doesn't matter that much. If they really like it and think they can sell it, and that would be the audience part of this, that's what really determines it, okay? So it's not, pr I mean, if you're really, really famous, yeah, but who, who's that? I've done six books. I don't feel that that really helps me to do a seventh or eighth. Um, I still have to knock on doors. No one's coming to me, <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that'll ever happen, and that's okay, that's okay. I always have to work to get what, what, what we get. I think that's fair. We have to work hard to get where we, where we get. Let me show you some of these images. I'm gonna go quickly if you have questions. So this is the first image, Coney Island. This came out in 2011, Coney Island, 40 years. This seems like an appropriate photograph to start the book. Um, you want to get a sequence for your book and get the sequence from day one. Don't wait till the end to sequence your photographs. If you have two or three or four or five photographs, start laying them out. I make prints. You could do it on light, in Lightroom. You could do it on Bridge. I don't love working on the monitor because uh, I can't, I mean, they're small and it's, I'm used to print, so I have a dark room. I'm still in the dark room making prints, or print, uh, you know, digitally make small prints, and then I can shuffle them around on a table. Um, and these are these are so the the book is sequenced in six chapters. I have 214 photographs in this book. There's 240 pages. That's a really large book. It only sells for fifty dollars. Uh, that's terrific. My publisher is Schiffer, S-C-H-I-F-F-E-R, and I really love them. I think they're really terrific. And um, they wanted more pictures, so I gave them more, and it c turned out 214 photographs. And I don't think there's too many. So that's a lot of photographs. Though. So I made it pal palatable for the viewer by putting them in chapters, sections or chapters. The first chapter is the, p the boardwalk. Um, the boardwalk. So this gives you like, I'm right on top of them. In this photograph, this kid ran toward me. He was running alone. It's raining. It's pretty desolate, isolated. Uh, I just stood my ground and now he's curving around me and I took one shot with the 21. And I think it's lucky, you know. Uh, and why am I using it? Because he's off the ground. I love the wet and I love his uh, reflection. Um, if he if, if one foot was on the ground, I probably wouldn't use it. Uh, here I'm really close, and I really like photographing the little guy right in the middle. He's the one I connected with, but all these other people were there, and that they obviously make the photograph. This was uh, New Year's Day. I went up to him. I didn't talk to him first. I shot, and then I talked to him because I like the one eye. Plus. What is he doing? He's eating a Nathan's hamburger? Not a hot dog. Who ever eats a hamburger from Nathan's? <laughs> Give me a break. So I thought that was curious and, and ironic in a way. You can see why I uh, would shoot her. She was in a bathing suit with a top, and I, I placed her in front of the, this gate. This, oh, this is 1982 when they had gates there. Now it's all cleaned up. and but I'm still shooting there. So I love the patterns and all the you know, stuff going on with her clothes and, and the gait and that, that uh, uh, connection. Uh, this guy turned around. I photographed him straight on, and that's what I usually do. And then he turned, and I, uh, I loved his hoodie and how black he was against the silver gate. And then how there's almost like two photographs split by the um, vertical uh, edge of the building and one is him in the silver background and then the other is the is the amusement park with the 
iconic uh, wonder wheel, and then the shadows on the ground. I don't think I saw the shadows when I shot. I certainly saw him and I saw the wonder wheel. And that all adds uh, an added layer, an element to the body of work. I would say anytime you see a man, a grown man in a diaper, go photograph him. Outdoors, <laughs> shoot him. Because something's either, well, unless he's so mental that you don't want to get close to him. But uh, photograph him because he'll probably make an interesting photograph. And he probably wants some kind of attention anyway. So this was, he's the new baby for the new, the, new, um, the new year, 2010. His banner and his glasses, said, I believe, 2010. Uh, this will give you an idea how close I get. I even asked them, can I have a lick? You know? <laughs> I don't think they gave me one, but I got a, a really close. Again, 21 millimeter. I use uh, Leica's M4s. I have two M4s. I use a 21 and a 35. I just bought a, a monochrome, a Leica monochrome. They're $8,000. Oh my God, I don't know what possessed me. And I'm not sure what to do with it. I mean, I'm a little lost with it. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it out. Every new camera. I never buy new cameras, by the way. I have a, and I use a Canon 5D Mark II. I just got that used because my 5D broke in India. I was in India. Um, I like this because there is an arrangement of people. I didn't arrange it, it's candid. I don't usually shoot candid, but I just couldn't resist all the body language, the arms up and around and down, and then the background, the signs. So I like to use a 21 because I get a lot of information in the photograph. It's hard in a way because you have to organize that. You have a much greater field to worry about. You're not real close. Uh, I'm four feet away, five feet away. I'm pretty much next to the guy on the left. And um, I just, I don't know, I, li I like it. I'm wondering, what, who, what are they talking about? Do they know each other? Uh, who knows who? They probably all do know each other. Well, the woman on the right is laughing. What's, what's that about? I chose this photograph because it's sort of a mistake. I didn't know that that hand would come in. I'm photographing the kid. He's probably crying anyway, and I like crying babies rather than smiling kids. And it looks like the hand slapping the kid or poking him in the eye. And I said, I've never seen a photograph quite like this. I'm going to go for it and use it. And so uh, I did, and, I, and I, I like it. This is a crowd during uh, the mermaid parade. This guy came up to me, and I like noses covered and funny hats and umbrellas and... Again, this is kind of an empty, rainy day at Coney Island. Now it's very crowded, but I love it. I recommend that you go there. And the third Saturday in June is the Mermaid Parade. So if you haven't photographed that, go to it. Go early. I go at 11 o'clock, and there's a place where they convene, you know, uh, and you can pay, you pay 5 or $10 a camera. You go in there, and they're dressing, undressing, painting their faces, getting ready, and you can photograph them, and it's, it's really good. Um, so this is the pier section of the book, and this is from 1970. This is 1970 when the crowds were there, and this is an old wooden pier. Now it's been rebuilt two or three times in, in this time, and it's backlit and silhouetted, so I like to shoot into the light as much as possible. Uh, fishing on the pier. Uh, this is the first picture I ever had published. It was in Life magazine, and I, I took it in 1970, and I think it was in Life magazine 1971. I should have quit while I was ahead. I wasn't even a photographer then. I was lucky, very lucky. And uh, he's so skinny, it's wide angle. And I took two frames. One, he was looking down, and then I heard the click, and then he looked up, and I was on my knees down. And, he, and he, I, then I shot as he's looking at me here, and then he said, get away, get away. <laughs> and I went away, but I got my shot. So he I did not talk to. You know. I like this guy. He's in a suit. It's July. It's hot. What's he doing there? My head is in the photograph, jumping. Anytime people are jumping off something, I would photograph it. Here's another instance. And he, he's jumping into the sand. There's not even water. At least here, there's water. And this is not allowed, but pe when the guards aren't around, and there's more now security, uh, they, they tend to 
some kids tend to do this. This is the new. Uh, this is the new ride. I forget the name of it. Um, and I wanted to represent that with the old. That is a, the Astroland Tower that they left. They closed the park in 2008, left that one small tower, that large tower as a remnant and a reminder. But last year, there was a windstorm and it started moving back and forth and they took it down. So that's not there any longer. So, and this is where the 21, and it's fully extended the, the people up in the air, and I wanted to get that with their feet out. And uh, so this section opens the amusement part of the book. Then I'm on a ride, I'm on the Wonder Wheel shooting down. I wanted an overview, and I wanted to be on some rods to shoot. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what she's, or not, what she's wearing or not. Uh, it's my secret. This is 1974, and this has been published many, many, many times. And it's um, uh, not there, obviously, any longer. It's, it's a, again, a, a, a 21 millimeter lens. Um, it took me a while to realize something's missing here. And it's not the antenna of the ant. Uh, this is a ride, it's parked, it's snow, it's winter. The, the cars are missing on the, on, the, on the Wonder Wheel, where you sit, yeah, so they take it down. So that's cool. This is the old Thunderbolt, and this is gone now. This was, uh, the owner lived in the house, and it inspired Woody Allen in his movie, what? Annie Hall, I think, where, the, where he as a kid, Woody Allen, fictionally lived in that house, and every two minutes, the roller coaster rumbles by. And I really like this because I didn't know why they were standing there. I photographed them, I waited with them. 10 minutes they were there, I didn't talk to them. And she's just staring with her three kids, staring, staring, staring. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe she's from the old country, she's never seen a roller coaster. Maybe as a kid she went on that and she's remembering, I just don't know. But it, I, this is one of my favorite quiet photographs, I would say, and they tore that down. And now the ballpark is there, the minor league ballpark. This is the inside of it. Uh, one year I got in beyond the fence and just put the camera on the ground and photographed, and it's very ghost-like, I think. Uh, another ride. So uh, the iconic parachute jump. Uh, here's the mermaid parade. They're getting made up beforehand, and you have access to this and it's terrific and they like being photographed. The problem is there's too many photographers there. Uh, she's looking at someone, another photographer. I like the way she's bending and then, I, and then the hula hoops. And this is uh, Big Mermaid. I didn't know her. Um, uh, I photographed her. And then the next year, this was 2010, in 2011 the book came out and I had a show at a gallery in Tribeca, and I made an announcement card for the show with this picture, and I took it to this, uh, 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 the Mermaid Parade that year in June. My show was in July, and I had cards. I was giving them out, because the show was coming up in a couple weeks, and she was there again. And I gave her a card, and she was thrilled. I didn't know her, and then I learned her name, Monica. I have her email. And she said, could I come to the opening? And I said, yeah, come. It would be great to have you. She showed up dressed like this. <laughs> no one looked at my pictures anymore. <laughs> Everyone was photographing her. She was the star. I said, Monica. And she came with her mother. Oh my God. And she's an office worker, I believe, in, uh, in uh, Midtown. Or she. So I made her friend, and I was happy she came. It was great. It was great. Oops, wrong way. Uh, parade. Uh, this is Michael Wilson, the tattooed man that I photographed a lot. And he's the head of the parade that year. He's Neptune, the god of the sea, and she's the queen of the parade. They, they've had Moby, they've had Laurie Anderson, I think they had Lou Reed. They've had well-known people kick off the parade. So it's a real fun event. Uh, this is a, uh, the reason I chose this, because she's on stilts and she's next, not next to, but she's echoed by the, parachute jump, and I love that. Okay, This I've sold many times. She's uh, Marsh, uh, Mermaids from Mars. Uh, this is 1970, a worker from 1970, and I loved his arm. 
I asked him to put his arm out because I wanted to photograph the tattoos. And in 1970, you didn't see a lot of tattoos. It's not like today. This is the first year I, I shot there. Uh, I like this because he is holding the ball in front of his face. And it's all about baseball, his shirt, the hat on the other guy, and the, and the concession. Norm, uh, again, wide angle, looking at me. I try to get close. I can't get too close here. And I like the all overness in this photograph. She's amazing. She's like frozen. She, this is a wax museum, and she's forever there with that big mouth open, and then that phone, that very primitive way of communicating, as it looks like to us now. Uh, uh, another worker, another worker. So uh, another section and chapter in the book are the workers. So, um, sequel, and then the final section is <coughs> the beach. So I'm going from inland to out, to out. I'm going from the rides inland to the edge of the ocean, uh, to the edge of America, or the beginning of America. So some beach pictures, the Polar Bear Club. Uh, this is the day, January 1st, they get, the polar bears go in the water, and kids do it. And you know, the, now there's, I'd say, a thousand people that go into the water. When I first started, there was a hundred people. It's gotten really big, and it's become a media event. I like this because it looks like they're walking on the face of the moon. It's like people are coming and going. And if I didn't have that little woman between the kid and the, and the, the man, I might not use it. She just fills that space and is curious and turned back at us. And I can't say I, I didn't plan it. I was shooting, shooting, shooting fast. Another thing that I do, I shoot a lot of frames of the same thing. I call it, I call it working, working it, working it. Maybe I'll do 10, 12, 15 with film, but now even more so with digital. Now I don't, you're not burning film, which costs money. You get the card and you have that. This is the cover of the book also. And you'll notice the cover is different. If you can see the cover, what did we do? Got rid of the hands. Why? Because we enlarged it for the cover. And uh, the hand, the, only the tips of the fingers would show. Maybe the hand, it was a little strange. So we decided just to Photoshop it out on the, uh, on, on the cover. But I, I prefer the image with the hands. And I didn't know them. I went up to them. There was a group of them. And they got up. They were on the uh, sand. And they got up and uh, just posed and hugged. And he looks like he's either drugged or he's drunk or he's in love, totally. I don't know which. <laughs> and she's totally happy. So, it, And I just thought, this says Coney Island with the iconic parachute jump. And there's a couple roller coasters back there. This is 1982. That's what, 30 some years ago. Wait, tw uh, 92, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if they're married and have 12 kids, or this was a summer romance, or they hardly even knew each other that day. I talked to them then, but I, there was no emailing. There was none of that stuff. Um, I like this because of the kid looking up at her and saying, wow, I can't wait to become an adult. Look at, <laughs> look at her. Wow. And she's freezing, and everyone else is warm and cozy, and she's showing a lot of her skin. Uh, one of the participants in the uh, polar bear swim, this is January 1st. It's freezing, and people are acting out. And I liked her because she's so within herself, and she's kind of bare. But she's covering her ears because she's cold. But what about her body? Why isn't she freezing? And I didn't disturb her. I didn't talk to her. I just saw her and I thought she was lovely. And just I liked the fact that she was so quiet and contained, self-contained, without uh, all the disturbances around her. And then this is the final image in the book. So uh, I thought this, you know, I always think about what starts the work and what ends the work. You know, what is the best photographs to begin and like can say what's going to come and what uh, the book is going to be about and what's a fitting ending. So this is dramatic. It's again the beach. It's the end of the country, the beginning of the country. It's looking out in the, to the future maybe. And Coney Island faced a, faces an interesting future with you know fixing it up and 
uh, where is it going, you know. Okay, so I wanted to show you some of that. Um, let me talk a little more about the books. Do your research. Every book company has its own uh, agenda. So certain, and, and their own point of view, like we have our point of view. So um, I wouldn't take a book on babies to a book publisher like MIT Press because they do societal or they do architecture, photo books, or um, technology, stuff on technology. So learn the orientation of the book company. Uh, for instance, um, um, W. W. Norton, and they published my first Coney Island book. They're interested in documentary photography. So that's, if we do that, I would go there. Uh, powerhouse, more societal, again, cutting edge. Um, um, uh, University of New Mexico Press, Western themes, if you're doing a book on Western landscapes or railroads or uh, cowboys and the Indian and Native Americans. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book on New Mexico. I go there every year. I do a workshop in August for ICP for the last 10 years, so I have a large body of work. I would go to them probably first, you know. So find out what these publishers are doing, uh, what kinds of books. And again, you can go books in print is a good resource. Um, and uh, it takes, I want to emphasize this, it takes a lot of research, research to know kind of what your orientation would, where, where you want to go. And pick out two or three or four companies and maybe, you can multiple submit. You can, in your package that I talked about, you could submit many, uh, you can submit one package to let's say Random House, one package to Norton, one package to Abrams, simultaneously. That kind of means you have to have uh, triple copies of the prints or your package. Uh, I, I haven't done that particularly, and um, I've done a multiple submit with two packages simultaneously, especially if you want to speed up the process. Because again, you should give them a month to hold on to it, and if they're interested, they might even say, I need another month. So it, you're out of commission, and you're just waiting around. Hopefully you're doing other things, you're working on other things, but you're waiting around. Another thing we should talk about is, um, once they, they say yes, what do you do? Mostly they say no, but if they say yes, they give you a contract, okay? And the co in the contract, you want to you want to really read it over carefully. More and more, the contracts are more in English and not so technical and gobbledygook language. You want someone to look at it if you're not very good at these things. Uh, either a lawyer you can hire by the hour to look at it. Someone, a lawyer who is in contract law and knows these about these things, not a lawyer who does real estate. Let's say, yeah. Could be a friend who's knowledgeable. Uh, you could barter that a little bit, um, but you and you can change the language. You can change certain things. So it's written from their point of view. It's a usually a generalized contract that might uh, might cover fiction and memoir, you know, writing and non-photo books. So it's not really written specifically to uh, a photo book, unless it's a photography company like Amphoto or Aperture, okay? So um, the things you want to look for, one important thing is the book should be, uh, upon the receipt of all materials, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, the book should be published within 18 months. That won't be in the contract, but I would put it in, and they'll put it in. Some things they won't, like they won't put in who the printer will be or what kind of printing, because that depends on money and they're not gonna uh, commit to that. But let me go back. The book should be published or printed, and by published I mean out in the bookstores, 
or out in the public domain <coughs> or in the public within 18 months of uh, receipt of all materials, all materials meaning the photographs and the text and all that. Why 18 months? It takes about, on the average, nine months to produce the book from the time you give it to them to the time it gets to the bookstore. So the first couple of months they do copy editing, they, uh, they um, um, what else do they do with it? They edit, they look at the sequence, they might come back to you and change things. Then they design the book, so that takes a month or two. Uh, then they have to find a printer, and then they do uh, a printing. They s and they print in, in China, uh, or Hong Kong, or Singapore these days, rarely here in America. Now I want to talk about that in a minute. And they, um, so that takes a couple months, and then you have a proof, and you might have a second proof. Okay, and then it's all approved, that's six months. Then they have to do the printing and schedule that. That could be three weeks, a month. And then they have to sh bind it <coughs> and ship it. And they might ship the loose pages and bind it here. They might bind it there, ship it. They get it into their warehouse, and then they have to do a sales job. And they're selling it in four or five months beforehand. Okay, so, and then the pub, and they call it a publication date, the pub date. Nine months uh, it takes. So if we say 18 months in the contract, it gives them some leeway. It gives them 18 double. It gives them double the time, which sounds fair. If something goes wrong or you have to reprint or <coughs> um, there's a mistake. For instance, on my artist book, th they, they sent me proofs back from Italy, a really good publisher. There were sepia tones. My photographs are in black and white. The book is a black and white book, not a sepia tone. I freaked. I said, no way am I going to let this happen. Where they had to re reproof it. It took three or more, four weeks more. They sped up the uh, schedule in other ways, and it still was on time. But they make mistakes. I mean, especially it's shipping back and forth and international. So give them about 18 months. And if something then happens, then, then you say all rights, if it's not printed within 18 months, all rights revert back to the author. That's back to you, to the photographer. You don't want this to happen. No one wants this to happen. That means you get everything back and you have to start over again. But it also means if they've given you an advance, you get to keep the advance. But these days, you don't get advances. You know. So you don't want that, but it's a protection. And they might say, oh, you know, the editor left, and we have a new editor, and we dropped the ball, but we still want to publish it, and we'll get right on it. We'll get on it, and it'll be 22 months. Would I take everything back? No, I probably wouldn't. Another four months, I've waited 18. I'm, I'm mad, but what the heck? I still want the book out, and I don't want to start over. And the book, you know, it's old stuff. I want to, I'm working on new things. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, um, you might want to change the uh, royalties, the amount that you get. So there's two ways you get paid. One is advances and one is royalties against the advance. An advance is upfront money when you give them the package. And you usually get an advance, if you're so lucky, in two stages. One, when you sign the contract, you get half. And, and then uh, you sign the contract. And in the contract, it'll say you have to give everything over to them in a year. They give you a date, or nine months, or three months, if you're comfortable with that. You, you, know, you negotiate that. And then they, um, you give them the materials, nine months later, say, on time. You get the second part of the advance. Let's say it's $5,000. You get $2,500 when you sign the contract, and $2,500 when you give them all the materials. <laughs> okay. Then you get royalties, and the royalties go against the advance. Normally, for hardbound copies, it's 8%, 8 to 10% of the selling price. 
So if a book sells for $40 and you get 10%, you get $4 a book if it's 10%. Um, making it easy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you get 10%, but you get the royalties against the advances. So for the first $5,000 for the advance that you got, you won't get any money. But after you reach $5,000, in royalties, then you'll get royalty checks beyond the $5,000. If they don't publish the book on time, if they screw up, if they make mistakes and you get the stuff back, the materials back, you get to keep the advance. That's the good part about an advance. Also, the higher the advance, you could say, the more vested interest they have in the book and the harder they'll work for the book. So it's always good to ask if they give advances. <coughs> I find, <coughs> and Schiffer, my publisher of these two books, and maybe the third, pro probably the third, they don't give <coughs> um, advances. And their royalties are kind of okay. I mean, 8 to 10%. If it's a softbound version, it's 6% on the selling price. So, um, you know, you... I, I mean, you want to, and it, you could try to negotiate. If you're Avedon, you say, I want 10% soft and 20% hard. And they're so desperate to have you because you're so famous that they say yes. So that's a negotiation. And you write that in the contract. You get royalties six months after or behind. So you, you get royalties every six months, let's say January 2nd and July 2nd, but it's always from sales six months ago. Why is that? Because book, pub, book stores can send the books back. A sale isn't made until it goes out of the bookstore, not when it goes out of the warehouse from the company. It's one of the only businesses that you can return the inventory uh, and get your money back. And that's tough. I don't think, like, if you do dresses and, or, I mean, food, you can't send back to the manufacturer or any of that stuff. So uh, they can still do that. And the publishers, I mean, that's the way the publishing business works. Other things to negotiate are your secondary rights. Like, there's first publication rights. There's serial publication rights. There's foreign rights. There's... Uh, 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 digital media rights, there's um, f um, movie rights, you know, there's t-shirt and calendar and postcard rights. So mostly that's 50%, 50%, and that gets written into the contract. They'll give you movie rights. Why? Because what movie's ever made based on a photography book? There's been one or two. Pumping Iron uh, by George Butler, I think, in 1970 or so. Uh, that's what made Schwarzenegger pretty famous. And then and there was a book on um, Belloc, Pretty Poison or something with Brooke Shields. That was her first movie. So it's, you know, it's totally rare. So yeah, they'll give you 100%. So subsidiary rights, it's an important way for you. Let's say you publish, you, you get it published in Esquire or uh, Playboy or something. Is Playboy still on? And they pay you $5,000 for it. Well, who gets that money? Well, 50-50. They get half. And why did they publish it? Because the, of the book. They saw it in the book. And, and it's good publicity for you, for the book. So these are things that you want to worry about. That's after the fact of uh, getting the book sold. I, uh, you know, there's, 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 situa there's topics of... Um, before you get a contract and then after. There's issues of PR and marketing and sales and all of that. The company usually has a PR person. They all have PR people. I find they don't do a great job. They'll get you some gigs, book signings, maybe on a radio or TV program, which I've been on some. But most of the time, I've gotten it. Why aren't they getting it? Because they have 100 books they're working with every season. And I'm only one of many. Uh -huh. So I hired for the first time a PR person, Andrea Smith for um, Harlem. 
and she did a really good job. And it was in the New York Times. It was, uh, I, I had four or five or six book signings. But honestly, I got a lot of the stuff myself. I mean, like, I'm here because I know I've done this before. I, I, I had a show at, like, a gallery. I arranged that. So you don't rely on PR persons, people solely, whether you hire someone or whether it's the company's PR person. And you want to maintain a mailing list, if possible. You should have an email list. And by the way, if you want to sign up on my email, I, I do a lot of workshops all over the world. I'm the director of photography at a gallery in, in East Village called Umbrella Arts, umbrellaarts.com. And we're going to have a call for entry uh, on, the th on the theme, I think, of kids. Uh, we did bed, we did dinner, we did um, home, and it's a great little gallery. So I could put you on, a, on, on the list if you want after. Um, so that was an aside. So where was I? <laughs> um, a PR and uh, doing it yourself also. You want to be, I'm going to leave you with this and I want to show you a little bit part of it. You want to be an active author. You don't want to just give them stuff and say that's it make a book because you'll get a lousy book or you'll get a book you won't even recognize. You want to give them the sequence. I don't say give them a book dummy, but you want to give them the sequence. You want to give them the text. You, and they might say, this sequence is not quite right or can we fix this or it doesn't lay out correctly. Yeah, okay. But at least start with your vision, not here's 300 pictures, make, take 100 and give me a, get, let's get a book out of this. No way. And I know photographers who did that, do that, or have done that in the past, and they're shocked. You want to look at the proofs. You want to, you know, uh, be available. You want to be an active author. Don't be a pain. Don't be a jerk. They want to work with a nice person, usually, and I hear that all the time. If this person's a jerk or an idiot, I, I don't want to spend a year working on this. And you'll be assigned an editor, and you can, uh, and you work with them. You work with them. It's a collaboration. It's you can do your own book, self-publishing. We could talk about that for a few minutes. Not that I'm an expert on that. I don't want to self-publish. I don't want to self-publish. Why? I'm stuck with a thousand books, or five hundred books, or a hundred books in my living room, or, or, or a storage bin, or storage. Uh, space I have to rent. It's no fun. It's no fun. I know people that do it. I think that's the last, last, last resort. Find a publisher. And it doesn't have to be a top-ranked publisher. There are small presses. There are university presses. I like university presses. There are historical societies. Maybe you're d you live up in Connecticut and you're photographing historical churches on the on the uh, on the shore the along the Connecticut shore I'm just making this up uh, there's a historical society not a hysterical but a historical <laughs> society uh, that you might find colleges university presses University of New Mexico University of Texas uh, MIT Yale they do great books almost every university has a press and Columbia here, uh, NYU has done photo books. Um, so, you know, there's a big world out there. Okay, so this is Harlem Street Portraits. And again, you can ask questions as I go about my technique or, or doing the book. Uh, these first ones are vertical. This is more formal, and I go up like I saw him. He's in front of his housing project on, I'm not sure what street. Uh, and he's holding a basketball, and that I thought worked. And you know, we talked for two, three minutes. I'm not making buddy, buddy, buddies. By the way, I did meet an ex-wife on the street photographing her, so <laughs> it worked out for a couple years. And then, you know, it changed. But you know, I've made friends, but that's not my intent. I'm trying to get a good photograph. She saw my cameras and came up to me. Can I, oh, you, you want to photograph me? Yeah, and she posed like that. I didn't pose her. Great. If that ever happens, always. If people ask, yes, I do it. Because it's hard enough to get people to do it. 
Uh, he has a cigarette in his hand and a lighter, and he's hiding them, mm. and he's all dressed. This is Sunday. I went to Harlem a lot on Sunday. He has, uh, this is a Harlem uh, Afro-American parade, which is fabulous in September, and I go there. Uh, and why am I photographing in Harlem? I live f five minutes away by subway. Uh, I had never gone there. I started in 1990. It's 23 years. And I went to this Afro-American parade, and it was very welcoming. People were friendly. Uh, I, I, I liked the vibes. Um, it was an interesting neighborhood. So I, get, I just I kept going back. If I'm welcomed, I keep going back. And I'm talking to people, and I come back, and they get to know me a little. This is in front of a church. I loved her cross, talked to her. And again, it's a 20, these are 21 millimeter lenses, maybe one or two or 30 or 35. This is a 21. And I'm, I see someone that interests me. I, they don't have to be beautiful. They shouldn't be ugly. Or, I mean, you know, they're normal people, and I, I want, I'm curious about them. I, I, I think they have a story maybe. I love people wearing shirts with faces on, on them. And I hadn't seen much of that. And I saw that a lot in Harlem. And I have 10 photographs in the book, bang, 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 one after another. And I asked them, like I might not, who they, I might not know who they are. I would say, I love your shirt. I love your shirt. I have to photograph you. And if I'm enthusiastic and friendly, then they, yeah, fine, no problem. I never had a thing, oh, you're a white boy in here. I never had that, never. So it, I, I, I love it, I, and I love the culture and, and their enthousi the enthusiasm and the street life. So here again, smoke. And he put the cigarette there. I said, no, no, you were smoking. I'd like to photograph you smoking. And usually I, I try for eye contact, and I want them to look into the lens. I want them, I, that's my, one of my styles. Like here's another shirt, um, and I compl I go in with a compliment. Go in, wow! I love your shirt. Wow, you guys look so cool. I'd like to take a f portrait of you or a photograph. Use the word portrait. It's it sounds like a little more uh, I don't know nice or interesting. Like him, yeah, he he was reluctant at first. No, I really love your shirt. I'll photograph your shirt. Well, with the wide angle lens, I I tended to get him in also, so it worked. And I'm looking for backgrounds that aren't distracting. Um, if, and I'll wait. I'll wait if someone's in the way. It's like they're walking, and maybe I want someone in. Uh, she was not real happy with me, but she, we, we, you know, uh, I, she let me do it. And I, I usually shoot three, four, five, six frames. If I like the situation, eight. Vertical, horizontal. I might move. Have the, Can you move over here a little bit because the trees in, in your head, and it doesn't look good in the background. And um, yeah, I mean, she had a baby carriage. She has a Barbie shirt. I like that. Uh, and then I saw her. She does seances, and she even asked me to her place to do a seance. I said, well, I'm out shooting. She asked me for lunch, actually. I said, well, maybe later, but I, I didn't want to get too involved with that. But any time I see someone like that, they want attention. So I go to parades, I go to events. Uh, I, again, here's this uh, attractive young lady with a KISS t-shirt. So what attracts you to a person? Why do you want to photograph them? Here are the couple, and I, they were together, and I guess I put them a little more together, and they were really happy to shoot. Um, I like the mural behind him. I thought that was pretty cool. It's like sur surreal, and it's falling apart. And he's on the phone, and he said, oh, should I get off? I said, no, no, pretend I'm not even here. That's cool. Uh, the background, and I like the sun on his lips. I thought that was good. So I'm watching light. Be aware of light. This is the cover. Uh, it's cropped on the cover a bit. I love this picture, and I thought this is like a miracle. This was a gift to me. Um, oh, I should look here. The, uh, this man, I've probably photographed him Ten times, ten frames, bang, bang, and he wouldn't look at me. I didn't speak to him. He wouldn't. He knew I was there, but he wouldn't acknowledge me, and that was fine. And this is in front of the church, and they're coming out of church, and ten frames, and the man on the top left, that made it perfect. He filled that space, 
and no one is looking at me, no one's looking at anyone else except the child looking at the man. And he's so dapper and he's so elegant, maybe that's his grandson or great-grandson, I don't know. And I just think it's, I just think it, and I love the, his darkness against the white pillar, the contrast, what, what he's wearing, and he, just he's in, in dark uh, clothing and against the, the white. It just worked. Here's a, a woman with her family, I guess, or her grandchildren. I saw this shirt, and he, this guy was really big. He looks even, he looks smaller than re real life. You say huge like it's a bad thing. I say, whoa, could I take your picture? And then this guy said, wow, look at your shirt. What is that, one hood? And he showed it to me. He, he held it out. So I like to interact. Um, I did, he, he definitely saw me. This is during a parade. This is that same church where the man was in front of the pillar. Now they put a gate in front. And she happened to come out and really made, I was doing a portrait of the kid, and then I saw her raise the camera, and she made the photograph. This is through a window and reflections. This is 1990. This is early. There's no graffiti up there now. It's really changed. It's cleaned up. Really, uh, There's new buildings, new stores, new restaurants. In a way, and you know, people are being displaced. The rents are higher. Uh, it's like again another gentrification. And then these g three guys were playing playing ball, throwing the b basketball around, and I just interceded. And he said, "You want me to spin it on my finger?" Yeah. And then I I like the frame of the two. I could have easily cropped them out, but I wanted that. And again, the twenty one let me do that and I'm four feet away. I could never do this with any other lens. And the 21 telescopes, and I like angles and corners, and it gives me energy and movement, the sense of movement. Um, here he's looking at someone else, there's his reflection, and my head, and you can see me in the bottom with the camera to my eye. And I, I like that one eye again. He's babysitting and he's not happy. Uh, this is a Sunday. I'm up there and he's he's stuck with the kids. I don't. I mean, I think it's his nep. His, his, they're not his children. That's what I, I love this because the way that her neck is so extended to me is amazing. And I talked to them. And this kid, he didn't move. He didn't move. He just let me shoot. We didn't talk. We just, sh I just, I did five, six frames, and I, you know, I might bracket a little bit, so it's whatever. And his hat, the environment, okay, his oversized coat. So little things attract me, like, oh yeah, I would probably was a kid and had an oversized coat at one time. This is a hand-me-down, right? I think this is the last one, yeah. So this is New York Street Portraits. I call it, well, no. This is Harlem Street Portraits. So, um, okay, it's, I guess it's almost 6 o'clock. Yeah. Any other question, or should we call it a day? Um, thank you. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.